I'm Robert Winston and I'm Professor of Science and Society here at Imperial College. And we sometimes forget at Imperial how many illustrious alumni we have, how many people who are still working at the college and those who've sometimes retired, and who more illustrious than my first interviewee, who is uh, Professor David Phillips, photochemist and teacher and presenter, communicator extraordinary. And I'm going to ask him a bit about his career. David, um, Tell us about photochemistry. What actually is it? Well, it's, it really is reactions caused by light. So um, molecules and atoms absorb light, become highly excited. They have a huge amount of excess energy, and they then can undergo processes which you could not drive thermally, the, the conventional kind of chemistry. But more than that, there are many processes which can only occur through an excited electronic state. So you have access to new forms of chemistry by using light as the driving force rather than heat. You've, I mean, you, you've had an, an extraordinary influence on photochemistry. You've, you've published over 500 papers. Um, what, what, apart from your work, your, I mean, some of the interesting medical stuff I'll talk to you about in a second. But what would you say um, is the most important aspect of the work that you've done? Well, uh, what I decide is more important yes. is, is not necessarily the world's view of what's most important. Um, I started out when I, I really became a photochemist when I went as a postdoc to Texas. I had used a lamp as a kind of Bunsen burner during my PhD program in Birmingham, but I really didn't understand the, the uh, physics, if you like, and chemistry of the excited state. I was simply using it to produce free radicals, which I then looked at the reactions of. Soon as I went to Texas, I was working for the grand old man of photochemistry, uh, a man called W. Albert Noyes, Jr., uh, and that's where I really began to understand the principles. And the, the, the big problem at the time was that we didn't understand the structure um, reactivity uh, basis of uh, for molecules. We knew if you excited some of them, you got fluorescence, uh, luminescence. If you excited others, you got a chemical reaction. And then most interestingly, for a whole broad range of molecules, you excited them and nothing happened at all. I mean, the, the molecules turned the excess energy they had into heat, which was then just dissipated in the surroundings. And that turned out to be quite important. So our driving force in those days was, how do we understand what dictates which molecules will do which? And so we needed a lot of basic information about um, those, how efficient was the fluorescent process, how efficient was the chemical reaction, how efficient was this non-radiative decay. And so I think I and a lot of other people at the time were interested in getting those fundamental uh, questions answered. But the real breakthrough came when we, we didn't have any method of making fast measurements. Uh, George Porter, of course, had invented flash photolysis, but that was really in the microsecond time domain. And many of these things I'm talking about occurred on a nanosecond and sub-nanosecond time scale. And so it wasn't really until the development of the laser in 1960 which allowed us to monitor these processes. And the first time barrier, if you like, was 10 to the minus 9 of a second, a nanosecond. That was quickly overcome, and picoseconds then became the standard, 10 to the minus 12 of a second. Uh, and so it went on. And so now femtoseconds are, are the kind of standard measurement. So when you went to Noyes Lab, uh, you had lasers then, did you? Is that, we is that why you went? We didn't, actually, uh, because I went in 64. The laser had only been yeah. demonstrated in 1960 by Theodore Maiman. That was a ruby then. Wasn't that it? was a ruby. And, uh, well, the, the helium neon wasn't very far behind, but the, the, it was the ruby. Uh, which came into use, I think, through the mid-60s uh, onwards. I got our first laser when I had started work in Southampton as a, an academic, and that was in about 1968, I think. Tell me about Noyes. He sounds like an interesting character. I mean, he sounds like a, a ferocious individual. 
Oh, I think ferocious is a bit too too fierce. He he was strict. He was strict. He was a martinet. And somebody told me before I went that you would be expected to work six and a half days a week. Uh, and as a postdoc, you're allowed Sunday afternoon off. But the graduate students were not. They work seven days a week. And I thought, well, this this can't be true. Nobody can work that hard. Uh, it was exactly true. Uh, we 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 really were expected to be there. He always started at eight eight o'clock in the morning, and he finished at six in the evening, and he expected you to be there if he was there. Well, I always found it extremely difficult to get in by eight o'clock. Eight fifteen was no problem. Eight o'clock, I had to beat the traffic to get in. My Research student colleagues used to make sure they were there by eight o'clock and wish him good morning, and then they'd disappear off to the students' union to have a, a leisurely breakfast. So I was always the one in disgrace because I went in and started work, but I was never there quite on time. He was, he was a, a, a great psychologist, I think. He understood how to motivate people, not just because of his example of interest in the subject. He knew what would uh, make get the best out of us. He knew how to do that. Uh, and in my case, it was a combination of kind of threats, if you like, and, and encouragement and support. Uh, and I, I grew to like him very much. I, I really was uneasy with him to start with. But I knew I'd arrived because he always was very formal, so that for the first year of my two years there, I was always called Dr. Phillips. And after the first year, he started calling me Phillips, and I knew that meant I was now accepted, and I was one of, the, you know, I was the leading postdoc in the in the group. In fact, I mean, by Texan standards, that's pretty unusual, isn't it? Because you you worked in Austin, the, the the city of the green roofs, and it 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 was quite a pleasant place to live. It was very hot in the summer, of course, but um, it was more civilized. There was a kind of oasis of, of dare I say, it, civilization in in real redneck country. Um, but because I was uh, a European, I was interested in other things than science, I'm interested in arts and whatever, I met a whole range of people and met some very distinguished people coming through. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, for example, I met. Uh, I met some good scientists as well. Uh, Paul Dirac, for example, uh, I went to a seminar uh, by. Um, Tom Wolfe, uh, you know, the, the writer, I, I went to... I, Socially, I had occasions with him that I, I, I enjoyed. So it was a kind of uh, a heady existence in many ways. I, a noise at the time I was negotiating with him was in the University of Rochester in New York. Uh, and he had been hired by Texas on his supposed retirement from, from Rochester to really um, rebuild the, the department in Texas. And was it true that there was already quite a lot of money, fl money flooding into the University of Texas at that time because of oil? Like that? Uh, it, it was the Welsh Foundation, which was... Uh, uh, Texas originally, the University of Texas, was one of the land-grant colleges, which meant uh, a swathe of land had been given uh, by the state in order to fund the university. Now, in most states, it was agricultural land of some value, uh, the Texans bucked the system because they gave them a patch of desert in West Texas, which had no uh, commercial value at all when it was done. But of course, that's where they discovered oil. So it became one of the richest universities in, in, in the United States. But that money can only be spent on, uh, it can't be spent on people. It has to be spent on infrastructure, equipment, and, and such like. So why didn't you stay in the States? Oh, interesting. Um, I enjoyed my time in the States very much. Because you weren't married. Uh, no, and, and I, um, I could have stayed, but I think the, I was there 64 to 66. So 64 was within nine months of Kennedy's assassination in, in Dallas. And I met more people in, not necessarily in Austin, but in Texas who, who were enthusiastic about the assassination rather than being opposed to it. And that made me think that maybe the United States wasn't the place that I wanted to be. So I, I had taken the decision I wanted to, to be back in Europe, but I wasn't quite sure where. So uh, what happened? Well, I was, uh, it was to, in about the spring, I think, of the second year I was there, so the spring of 66, 
uh, the old man Noyes uh, was uh, uh, on the uh, executive committee of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, and he uh, there was a committee meeting there. And as you probably know, you you don't walk anywhere in in Texas; you have to drive. Of course, these high-powered delegates coming in uh, didn't have cars, so each of us working for for Noyes was given one of the delegates to look after for the week that they were there. And just by chance, I happened to get the Russian, uh, who spoke good English. Uh, he was deputy director of a, a big institute in, in Moscow. And I was telling him that I was intending to come back to Europe, but probably needed one more uh, postdoctoral experience before I looked for an academic position. Uh, and he said, uh, whether he meant it or not, I don't know. He said, uh, why don't you come to Moscow? And I said, well, it's a sufficiently off-the-wall idea to, to, to do. I thought about it. Uh, and uh, wrote to him and said, yes, I, I would come. And he said, oh, well, that's fine. You uh, should arrange it through the Royal Society, which is uh, the exchange for the Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society will, will look after it. So I wrote to the Royal Society and said, uh, please arrange it. And I got this incredibly snotty letter back from the Royal Society, which said, was I aware that there were only four such exchanges um, in the whole of science and engineering each year. Uh, and normally they would decide who went and who didn't go. However, since I had been nominated by academician Kondratiev, I would be one of the four, <laughs> and so that was it. This is the height of the Cold War. This was in 66. So this is after the Cuban Missile Crisis, but I mean, we are in very serious conflict uh, intellectually in many ways. It was a jump. Uh, it was... Uh, something I was prepared for. I mean, we were briefed before we went, the, the four of us who went. Did they have a good track record in photochemistry? Uh, not particularly, and indeed I, I didn't work on photochemistry when I was there. I, I was working on an aspect of luminescence which which related to it, but wasn't, it wasn't the continuation of the work I'd been doing in, in the US. Uh, it was actually on chemiluminescence, and, and that I continued that when I came back from, from Moscow. But I was the only Westerner working in a, a group of 2,000 uh, workers in the Institute of Chemical Physics. And so I was a, a kind of uh, curiosity. And uh, So how long did you stay in Moscow? I was just under a year, so it was about 11 months in total. It must have been quite interesting coming back to the West. I mean, there must have been a feeling of, I mean, I'm, I know that feeling of coming back from the East Bloc and the feeling of release you get after leaving, say, somewhere like East Germany, which which I remember very vividly. I left, I came by ship uh, from um, what was then Leningrad, and the first place we stopped on the way back was uh, Helsinki, which, which is a nice little city, but not, nothing it's exceptional. Little, really. And I really, uh, the scales fell from my eyes. I really felt like I'd been in prison for a year. Uh, partly the, uh, this kind of free atmosphere, partly this was in 1967, and there were all these beautiful girls <laughs> with, with short skirts, and you know I hadn't seen any of, any of that in in Moscow. Um, but it's it's not something I ever regret. I really uh, learned a lot about myself in Moscow. I learned a lot about uh, a new branch of science which I hadn't known much about. And, and did you have a job to go back to? Because you go to Southampton, don't you? After this, I I did, as it happens. All of my fears about getting an academic position from being in the United States, I'd applied for a number of positions thinking I wouldn't even get interviewed because uh, I didn't think they'd fly me back for an interview and I, didn't, I couldn't afford to, to come back. As it happens, I was offered three lectureships while I was still in Texas. Uh, one was uh, Manchester, one was, uh, but that was a, an ICI fellowship which would be converted to a lectureship. One was in Kent, a new university, and one was in Southampton, and I knew a little bit about Southampton. As it happens, the head of department um, was visiting the States, and he came through to post offer of the job. He came through to make sure I didn't have two heads or something. And it was, it was, I was quite reassured that this was a good job to go to. So I had the job, uh, and they gave me a sabbatical leave for the first year of the appointment so that I could still go to Mo uh, Moscow. One of the things that scientists often talk about is the insecurity of the next job 
Did you did you experiment Saturday time? It seems to me as if you were constantly in employment. I think we lived in golden times, though. You know, it, the, the degree then, uh, certainly PhD in was chemistry, in was a passport to to success and and, and employment. I was offered th three lectureships, where the, I hadn't. Nobody had interviewed me. They hadn't even seen me. That was just based on the record. And I had three um, industrial positions, one of which had been held open for me while I went to Texas. Uh, and in the end, I decided I wanted an academic career. But it was, it was a golden age. There were, it was the Robbins expansion. There were, there were still lots more opportunities for people. Funding was, uh, was, was available. Uh, yeah, it was the tail end of the, the white heat of the technological rev revolution, as, as Wilson put it. Uh, it was, it was a, good, a good age. I mean, it, it changed, of course, later, but, but at that time, late 60s through to mid, mid 70s. And what was Southampton like? The university, I thought, was great because it was, it was moving, it was expanding. Chemistry, in particular, was, was, was very good and very good to me. Uh, the town was uh, a bit dull, shall we say, um, but uh, the, the academic side of things were, were, was wonderful. But I met my wife there, so I, you know, I, I, I have fond memories of it. And of course you started to supervise PhD students, have you? Uh, right at the beginning, yes, uh, right from 1967 onwards. And I see that you've supervised a over 50 PhD students. 50 something and about the same number of postdocs, I think. So, uh, so you've done a phenomenal legacy there. I, I think that's one of the most enjoyable aspects of a, an academic career, actually. Uh, finding people who are better than you are. I think, you know, there are some, some supervisors who resent the, the qualities of some of the students they've got. And I think that's that's the best thing you can do. Find somebody who's really good and then help them uh, realize their own potential. And I've, I've done that in a num number of cases. And the other thing that, you know, we, we often when we're teaching or when we see people teaching, the great geniuses, the Nobel Prize winners, and the these hugely, obviously illustrious people are put up as role models. But you've talked about collaboration in science, which surely is far more important than being a great genius, isn't it? I think the, uh, who knows? I mean, geniuses very often, if, if they're recognized as such, are, are driven people and uh, they are um, not necessarily the best at, at collaborating. I mean, it's a, that's a generalization, but on the whole, they're, they're kind of lone voices, as it were. I've always found personally and in most of the people that I interact with, that, that collaboration is the way forward. I mean, after all, science is a, a, a great collaborative effort, isn't it? You, you build on what's gone before, and so... It's an odd like mixture of competition and collaboration. Well, it is. Yeah. But of course, within your own group, that's where the collaboration is obviously essential. I think that was true when I was younger, that, that you, you had to motivate the younger people, give them interesting pro uh, projects, uh, questions to ask, and then help them find the answers. Uh, but the way chemistry developed, uh, you very much found that we were collaborating, the, the science moved forward because you collaborated with people of different disciplines. So chemists working with physicists, particularly, of course, chemists working with biologists, and then more recently with, with uh, uh, medical people. Uh, and it's, and I'm missing out engineers, which play a, a huge role, of course, as well. And it's that bringing to the table the different um, backgrounds, if you like, which really, I think, has made science progress uh, become, uh, I think, in, in the West has become really uh, a force to be reckoned with. I'd like to go back a little bit to your family origins, if, if, yes. if I might be personal, because you, you come from the northeast of... Uh, I was actually born in the northwest. I was born in Kendall in Cumbria, Westmoreland as it then was, but that's only because my mother, uh, bearing me, uh, I was born in December 39, and in the war started, of course, in September 39, and it was felt that Tyneside would be bombed immediately. 
And so we were evacuated to Candle in Cumbria so that uh, that's where I came into the world. But we didn't stay very long because um, there wasn't any bombing. So we went back to Tyneside whereupon the bombing started. And so we were then evacuated to uh, a farm in rural Durham, which is where I spent the first eight years of my life. And your dad was a prisoner of war? He was a River Tyne pilot uh, and he in order to qualify to take bigger and bigger ships into the Tyne, you had to get the normal qualifications of a, 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 a seagoing uh, navigation officer. So he happened to be at sea uh, working for his skipper's ticket when war was declared and they were short of seamen. And shortly afterwards, very short of seamen because of the, the losses. Uh, and so he stayed at sea and so he was on a, um, a tanker um, called the Demeterton, which uh, was sunk by the German pocket battleship, the Scharnhorst. But they fired warning shots and they were able to get off the he ship. Off, uh, so he got off, then they sank the ship. And he spent four and a half years in a prisoner of war camp in Germany. So I never knew him, of course, until he came back, because I was too small. He was captured in January 41, I think. So you brought up my bevy of women, were you? Does it show? Uh, <laughs> um, Yes, my, my mother was one of six sisters, and f three of them uh, lived in this, uh, this farm. Uh, so I was thoroughly spoiled, I think. Um, uh, and I, I had no siblings until my father came back. So there's eight years between me and my sister, and then I have a brother ten years younger than me. So I was the center of attention, as it were, and uh, I'm sure that accounts for my character in some some detail. But I went to school when I was four and I went to the local village school where because there were relatively small classes you, you more or less uh, sat in class where you were capable of, uh, of, of taking in what was being said and so I, I very quickly uh, moved up the ranks as it were because I could hear what the other children were being taught and I responded accordingly. When was your first science lesson? My first science lesson really was when we'd moved back to South Shields and on Tarnside and I went to uh, the local school and there was an inspired teacher there, a man called Danny Burke, uh, who in addition to schooling us for the 11 plus, which, which was all important in those days, found time to, to teach us all kinds of things, but particularly science. And so once a week we had about two hours doing experiments, simple things, you know, iron filings and magnets, uh, uh, depression of the, the uh, elevation of the boiling point, depression of the freezing point, simple physical experiments. Uh, and that just absolutely switched me on. I, I, How old were you then? Eight. Because most schools didn't touch science until... Oh, it wouldn't have been until secondary school. And he, he, this was his own interest, I think, but he, I think he also enjoyed opening, opening eyes, and uh, he, he was very successful at it. There was no curriculum, presumably, as such? No. It had nothing to do with, uh, I mean, the real business was getting good scores in the 11 plus so we could, we could get to the grammar school. But, but he, I mean, it wasn't just science he did this in. It was practical things in geography and history and whatever as well. But it was the science which really... Uh, and when did you start to think about science? I mean, as a you know, as a possible more well, serious interest. If there was a general curriculum, a range of subjects when we went to the grammar school, of course. But uh, it was decided that those of us who were most academically able, and that was a class of thirty of us, had been selected they would put us in for O-level one year early, earlier than normal. So we were in an accelerated class, and that meant they wouldn't allow us to take as many subjects as normally you would take. So I think we took eight rather than ten, and that means you had to select which were you going to do humanities or were you going to do uh, languages or, or science at age just over 12, 12 and a half, I, I had to decide. And I, I liked language and I was quite good at it. 
Um, and so there was a real question, what was I going to do? But the head, head teacher, uh, this was you know, immediately post-war, the country is going to need scientists, it's going to need doctors, uh, secure future there. Uh, and so that's how I chose it. But it. It wasn't necessarily something that I felt passionately inside, but it was a good choice. Why chemistry and not, say, physics or biology? Well, uh, I have a confession to make here in that by the time I'd come to um, A-level choices, I think I got bad advice. I, I was unsure whether to do chemistry or physics. I knew I didn't particularly want to do mathematics, you know, pursue it uh, exclusively. And so to hedge my bets, I was advised, well, take A-level physics, A-level chemistry, and A-level pure and applied mathematics as one subject, which is what I did, and then discovered too late that in order to get into a physics department, they wanted physics and pure maths and applied maths as separate subjects. Of course, mathematicians wanted that as well, and so the only subject that was really open to me was chemistry. Uh, and I mean, I enjoyed chemistry, but by second year of A-level, I th probably was enjoying physics a little bit more. So it's no surprise that I became a, a, a physical chemist or a chemical physicist. So after coming, going forward to Southampton, then, then you come to this place, to Imperial College. No, I had a, I had a break. I, I, went, I left Southampton to become Wolfson Professor oh, right. yes. in the Royal Institution. Yes. Yeah. George Porter was director. You, you, it's a small institution, only really enough room for one kind of research theme there. And so George was looking for somebody who would uh, help him with the educational side of things, the, the demonstration lectures and the other things that were happening, but would also be in the same sort of general area so we didn't we weren't competing for space so why did george choose you good question um i i developed a something of a reputation for um demonstration lectures and that that had happened in my undergraduate lectures in southampton i always tried to do at least one demonstration just to to whiz it up a bit and keep them awake and whatever you mean a bang? Doing it well, not necessarily, but just something that would catch their interest, which was relevant to to the day's uh, scientific agenda. Uh, on a particular occasion, there was an external lecturer coming down from University College, uh, Ron Nyholm, um, to to lecture to uh, school kids, and these kids were being bussed in from all over Hampshire, and with about an hour and a half to go, he was taken ill, and so he had to cancel couldn't stop the kids coming on the buses. So the head of department came to me and said, uh, you've done a few demonstrations, haven't you? And I said, yes. And he said, right, you're on. You you do this lecture. So I very quickly put some things together and talked to these kids about photochemistry, in fact. And to my astonishment, it was, it was successful. And I got lots of invitations immediately afterwards to do the same. So I refined it then. So I had this reputation. That, would, that was one half of things. And I also had a developing reputation in, in the, uh, the research, I think. Uh, we had, actually before George's group, got involved in a technique called time-correlated single photon counting, which was the way to measure nanosecond and sub-nanosecond fluorescence decays, which gave you all the quantitative information you wanted about the, f the fates of molecules. And so he knew that, and so he invited me to be a candidate for this this chair. What date was that? Well, that must have been in 79. So he, he wins the Nobel Prize. He won the Nobel Prize in 67. 67, quite, quite, quite a bit earlier. Quite a bit earlier. Yeah. Uh, but he, he had wanted to expand. Um, he, uh, I think they had to raise the money. I think that was the thing, to, to get a second chair, because... The Royal Institution had no external source of funding uh, other than what you won, as you well know. Uh, and it lived on a, uh, on a shoestring in many ways. And so they had to wait for a... a um, they obtained the money from the Wilson Foundation to, to re-found this chair, which had been a historical Victorian chair. So the RI at this time, of course, is a, is a great institution for promulgating 
science, isn't it? I mean, people, it influences a lot of young people. At that, at at that time, time, yes, it, it, it uh, had a, um, a very uh, pronounced uh, emphasis on schools, demonstration lectures, because that was the medium that we used. It was sort of pre the, the kind of electronic communication that we have now. Um, I was given quite soon asked if I would run the whole education program. So I, I ran all the school's lectures and we started things called science seminars where we went out into schools to, to interest them in a particular branch of science, get them to do experiments. Uh, we started the, I didn't personally do this, but we started the mathematics master classes which became hugely successful and still are. We started some technology master classes in, in Sussex uh, it was it was a thriving institution at the time. When did you give the Christmas lecture? That was in 87, 87, 88, uh, the, the, the December. Well, <laughs> by then George had gone and we had a new director, uh, John Morick Thomas, from, from uh, who's a, essentially a, a crystallographer, um, a materials chemist, if you like. And it was decided that we would give them jointly, but it was a kind of cobbled together um, theme called crystals and lasers. Uh, so he did the crystals and I did the, the lasers. And we, w there were six lectures in those days. So the first one we did jointly, then he did two, and then I did two, and then we finished off the last one jointly. And surprisingly, it worked. It, it, it worked quite well. Do you have powerful lasers in that room? In that we room. did, we did. We, uh, the experiment I, I think I enjoyed most on, in those lectures was a recreation of an experiment John Tyndall had done where he had somebody play a cello down in the basement and then he had a wooden pole which came from the sounding board where the cello was being played up onto another sounding board in the theatre so you could hear the cello perfectly well in the theatre and it was being played remotely down below and it was just to illustrate that you could transmit sound uh, uh, up a, a solid pipe. So what we did was we, um, we modulated a laser beam. So the sound modulated the, the laser beam and we recreated the sound uh, in inside the the uh, the lecture theatre, so, so the beam came up through the floor rather than the than the the wooden pole. Uh, I thought that was wonderful. I really enjoyed that uh, because it it had the historical connection to to John Tyndall. Of course, you've got quite an interest in music, haven't you? Um, I'm I'm not a practised musician, but I do have a a great love of music. Yes, I, I'm. I learned the piano when I was young, but my father was a very accomplished pianist, and and I think. In the end, I decided I couldn't compete, and so I, I gave it up. I, I regret that I, I didn't get to your Faraday lecture at the Royal Society, which, of course, is one of the key kind of communicative events in, in science. What, what did you talk about? I was, I think, talking about... Um, it's a good question, isn't it? I have a feeling I was talking about chemistry in the atmosphere because it was very important at the time, and I... I did do a demonstration lecture um, in the Royal Institution and, and still do and, uh, on uh, chemistry in the atmosphere, the ozone layer and, and tropospheric chemistry, which of course is now in, is heavily biased towards talking about global warming. Um, I think I just, you, you, you didn't have, uh, I, well, we must have had an, almost an hour, mustn't we? I think maybe I just took a selection of hour, selection yeah. of demonstrations which yeah. I thought illustrated points. And the, the theme I had was that there's no point in doing uh, a kind of magic show uh, just for effect, that you have to choose your, your illustrations to match the, the science that you're trying to get across. And so I was giving different different demonstrations uh, in that line. But I, I managed to work one or two explosions into it as well, which uh, I think always works. And by this time you were at Imperial? That's right. But when I moved to Imperial, uh, they wanted me, I think, as a, as, a, as a research scientist, and I think my reputation was good enough to, to qualify. Uh, but they also wanted the bonus that Eric Ash, who was then the rector, 
and, and was also secretary of the Royal Institution, uh, had decided that we couldn't rest on our laurels in Imperial and just assume that uh, there would be a good flow of students into Imperial because of the research reputation, that we should actually be doing our bit in schools, uh, enthusing them with science. And you know, this, this was actually almost a duty. And, and I've always felt that. I really strongly felt that. And as an academic, you pretty well headed the outreach in consequence, didn't you? Well, I, we started it, actually. There wasn't one when we, when we came here. So uh, uh, I, I started up. We recruited a young lady from... Melanie. Uh, Melanie uh, Tony. From the uh, Royal Institution and built up from there. There was actually quite a lot of uh, opposition at the time. There, there, there was a general view... Uh, amongst uh, departments that uh, they've got a plentiful supply of very good students. Why should we be wasting our time uh, trying to enthuse uh, school children, many of whom wouldn't be able to come to Imperial because they wouldn't be qualified? But I think we proved right in the end. I think uh, you know we, we, we do have a duty, and it is important that we, we raise the awareness. It's taken a hell of a long time, hasn't it, to persuade universities in general that this aspect of public engagement is critical? It's a, it's a much healthier uh, situation now in that many universities now have strong outreach programs. But, yeah, it took a long time, a, lo a lot of effort. Tell me about the Pimlico project. Pimlico preceded uh, me being here. It was a, a Sinclair good, good lad uh, who was on the humanities uh, side here, um, had thought it was good for the college to be involved in helping uh, school science, but also very good for our own students to be involved. And so the Pimlico project, as the name implies, started in, in Pimlico, and it involved undergraduates and also some postgraduates spending, I think it was just Wednesday afternoons, in the school, but over a protracted period, so at least one term and probably a year would, would be ideal. And so the role of our students was to assist the teacher in getting concepts across, providing new materials for, for them, dem uh, new experiments for them to do, uh, and generally uh, acting... Uh, in in a school support role, which also, of course, made them think about uh, how their own understanding of their subject, and I think that was one of the great benefits. We couldn't turn that into uh, a recruitment of teachers because there was this wasn't and still isn't any any. Uh, education uh, qualification offered by Imperial. But I think many of our, our students who went through the Pimlico uh, project did end up in, in education in, in various places. Given that places like Imperial College are not really needing to, in many ways, to advertise their wares to the most exciting and engaging and intelligent students, why should we bother with science outreach? Because I think my research, probably yours, uh, most people's research in this, in this institution uh, is funded publicly. And we owe it, therefore, uh, to be able to explain to that public what it is we are doing and why we are doing it. So we have a duty, I think, to, to the wider public to let them know uh, how their money is being spent. The other reason, I think, is that um, well, there are several more, but we, we do need in the UK, if we're going to stay afloat financially, we need to have a plentiful supply of uh, scientifically able um, students uh, and professionals who will carry forward the scientific flag. But more than that, we need a scientifically literate population because the decisions as to what we should be doing are not the decisions of scientists, they're the decisions of the general population. And if they are incapable of understanding the scientific arguments which are behind, or a distillation of them, then we're, we're flying blind, as it were. And so we need that 
that um, level of understanding in the general population as well as the specialist training that we have. But I have a personal reason why I, I want to see this happen. Is in my lifetime, I've had such a huge enjoyment out of doing the science that I've done uh, and, uh, and talking about it. I want other people to be able to have that sense of enjoyment and, and, and the sense of achievement. Uh, and science is a way of, of um, earning a living which, which is immensely enriching and satisfying to the individual as well as being useful to the general population. You, you become a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry and you end up actually as its president. And the Royal Society of Chemistry has really focused very much in these areas, hasn't it? It, it uh, has had a campaign for about 10 years or more on, on trying to enthuse uh, young people with, with science particularly. Uh, we, we have a program also of, of trying to help teachers I mean, as we both know, I mean, the, the number of qualified teachers qualified in their own subject teaching science at secondary level is, is bad enough. I mean, it's, what is it, 17% or something in, in uh, chemistry uh, of, of the secondary school teachers uh, actually have a, 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 a degree in, in, in the subject, maybe slightly higher, I'm not sure. But at primary school level, there's almost no teacher which, who has uh, any scientific qualification. And I think we, we, we are aware that we need to help those teachers who are not scientifically trained to, to cover the, the subject. So the Royal Society of Chemistry has uh, a series of uh, courses for non-scientists or non-chemists to enable them to, to help them to, to, to teach chemistry. And that, I think, uh, has been very successful. But it's not enough. I mean, we, we, need, to, we need to recruit people into teaching who have the, the qualifications. And most recently, you've been a member of the Vision Committee at the Royal Society, which, of course, has been looking at science education. What do you think... Well, first of all, what does the committee recommend? And secondly, what do you think the impact of that might be? Well, one of the main recommendations, I think, is uh, that given that all children are going to be staying at school till 18, except those who divert into apprenticeships and, and uh, vocational training, uh, we should use that as an opportunity to m ensure that all children through to 18 are being taught science and mathematics, and probably English as well. But but our view, our, um, we were restricted to the to the science side of things. They should be taught till eighteen. Do do courses in in science and mathematics. Uh, that doesn't mean they'll all do A level chemistry. It means the quite probably the majority of them will do something which is is where the science is part of say science and society a course which is not rigorous science. Some will, of course, because they're the people who go on to do science at uh, universities. So um, we have an opportunity to, to uh, change what is being taught and the way it's being taught. Um, we, um, let me think, uh, that was the first of them. Uh, um, it was in maths, of course, isn't there? Well, uh, ma uh, yes, I, by science and, and uh, uh, we, we, we need uh, mathematics training to the I mean, same one level. One of the things I wonder is, I mean, it seems to me that one of the risks we're getting into is as, as we learn more and more in depth about less and less in science, that we channel young people. So there's one notion, of course, that we could get round that by changing the qualification at A-level. That was the other point I was, I was coming to, which uh, you, you've articulated well. Uh, the idea and, and my own personal experience of having to choose what I wanted to do aged not yet 13 is absurd. I mean, we, we should be offering a general training uh, across a range of subjects, I think, through to 18. Uh, and then uh, the specialization comes afterwards. That will have a huge knock-on effect on the universities, of course, the way they currently are. 
But that's the way they operate, operate in the United States, and there's, there's uh, no shortage of highly trained scientists in the United States. It can be done, but it does imply a big change in, in the way we do things in the UK. And I think uh, the, the baccalaureate-style uh, education up to 18 is something which I personally see uh, great merit in. When you started at Imperial College, how many women were there in chemistry? Oh, what a, what a question. There were two uh, in, on the staff. Uh, there were a number of postdocs, but not that many. And I remember Julia Higgins, who took a particular interest in this, uh, in chemical engineering, um, collaring me one day in the, this common room and saying, uh, David, that's not good enough. Uh, you, must, you, you must improve things. And I said, I, I have every intention of so doing. Twelve months later, uh, we had no chemists, uh, no female chemists in Imperial, because one of them who was uh, of an age, she, she retired, uh, and that was fine. Uh, the other one was young, but her husband uh, got a job in California, and so she moved to California. So I started with a, a clean slate, uh, and it took a little while, um, but we now have, uh, and this is no thanks to me, I mean, I think I started the process, but. I think we now have something like, um, it's still not enough, but it's 20 odd percent uh, women. And that really should, it should be parity uh, if, if, uh, if we can get there. But we're in the right, on the right tra trajectory. Really intriguing um, part of your work, of course, is the development of phototherapy, which you've been heavily involved with. Tell us about how that actually works in, for example, cancer treatment. Well, it, I got into it by accident, which we can come to later, perhaps. But it uh, involves the injection into the bloodstream uh, of a, a dye, which absorbs um, red light, essentially. So the dye has to be blue or green, because that's what absorbs red light. Uh, these are chosen so they have some preference for tumor tissue compared with normal tissue. Uh, and then you excite with a red laser, uh, a red Yes, a red laser. Uh, and you turn on some chemistry, which turns out to be quite simple chemistry, which then destroys the tissue surrounding the dye. Uh, it's called photodynamic therapy. It's been around since the uh, late 70s, 80s. Um, and we got into it really by accident. I was um, giving some lectures in the Royal Institution uh, on lasers, applications of lasers, and it occurred to me I hadn't got any medical applications of lasers. And so we got in touch with a, uh, a young surgeon in, in University College Hospital, Stephen Baum, uh, who's a gastroenterologist, uh, and went across to borrow some film fr from him. Uh, and in the course of that uh, process, we, he asked what I did. and. I was at the time working in part on, with Unilever, trying to develop a dye which would act as a cold water bleach so that you, you, the detergent works perfectly well at room temperature, but bleaches don't. And this, the idea was you would have this material which when you hung your washing out to dry, the sunlight would turn on the bleach and, and take stains away. And it does work, in fact, it worked very well. And he said, oh, that's fascinating. Uh, so this molecule actually destroys organic uh, material. And I said, yes. And he said, well, funnily enough, I've just read a paper on a technique called photodynamic therapy where you can destroy tumors uh, this way. And we just speculated over a drink. Wouldn't it be interesting if this material we had made for bleaching the, the underpants uh, would, would work as a, as a dye in, in the therapy? And it did. And so that's what uh, got us involved in it. So you introduce the laser down a blood vessel or, or down, a, it, down the gut? or much easier to do a hollow organ because you can use an endoscope. Uh, it is successful in organs like the pancreas where you know there's, there's very little treatment. You, you put needles through externally uh, and a, a fiber optic inside the needle. Then you withdraw the needle so the fiber optic is there, single mode fiber. And you can get enough light in there to, to do that. And that, that's quite encouraging. 
But externally, uh, skin tumours and ear, nose and throat are, are easily treated. Bladder cancer also is, is treated the same way. And didn't you form a spin-out company at some point? We did. We formed a spin-out company in, in Imperial in uh, about 2002, I think, when we started. And it's still going. It's still going strong. We, we had got to the stage where what we wanted to do was to make these dyes much more specifically targeted to the tumour compared with normal tissue of the same type. And so we used, uh, in collaboration with uh, some biochemists, we, we uh, tied the dyes chemically to monoclonal antibody fragments. So that's the recognition uh, element. Uh, and we could carry as many as 10, slightly more, uh, 12 dye molecules per monoclonal. So you have a high concentration of the dye exactly where you want it and then you turn on the laser and it destroys the, the tumour. And we've got right to the point that we've done the proof of concept, we've done all the animal testing, uh, but phase one, two and three clinical trials are expensive and so the company's still looking for the, the resources to do that. In the meantime, it's, it's diversified and so uh, it's using the same technology not to carry dyes which need lasers to excite them, but other toxic chemicals which will destroy the tumour uh, directly. And it, it apparently is doing very well. It's finally going to move from the premises in Imperial College to uh, some premises in Stevenage, I think. Uh, and there's a tie-in, I think, with Glaxo uh, also. And what else are you proud of at your time at Imperial? Proud of my time in Imperial? Um, well, if we leave the science to one side, I think I became head of department in 1992. Uh, I hadn't been here very long, but the, uh, the then head of department, Steve Lay, moved to Cambridge, and all of the other professors were relatively uh, near retirement, and so I was fingered to, to take this on. Uh, and unusually, I did two terms of five years, so I was ten years head of department, which, which is quite a burden. We decided... Uh, I and one other senior colleague that the way the department had been organized was very strictly along organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, physical chemistry. They were the traditional boundaries. And they were each run as kind of separate fiefdoms. And going back to what we said earlier, I was strongly of the view that uh, collaborative research was the way forward. Collaboration within chemistry, but also with other partners as well. And so we needed to break down these silos within the department. And so we, in, in 96, I think it was, we kind of abolished the old uh, three, three uh, subsections and we formed then seven research groupings mm. uh, where the head of the the group was actually elected by the group rather than being appointed externally. Not popular in one or two quarters, but on the whole immensely popular with the young staff. And that, that had a tremendous release of energy. I mean, it really was remarkable. The, the success rate in grant applications went up. The process that was continued by Richard Sykes, wasn't it? It, it was. I think, um, I, I, I'm not sure it was a... It, a unique idea uh, for us in, in the college, but we were the first chemistry department in the country to go down this route, uh, and uh, many others followed suit, and, and Oxford are now talking about it. You know, it's a <laughs> And what about mathematics inside the Department of Chemistry? Well, we, we did require, and still do require, that all of our incoming undergraduates have a mathematics A-level, uh, because it is... Uh, still a, a quantitative subject and you need to understand mathematics to, to, to grasp it. Um, we rely on the math mathematics department to teach our mathematics and that's done um, partly because they're, they're expert of course but partly because their research income in the, the financial model that the college used to use, I'm, I'm not sure now, but in, in that financial model, um, they couldn't bring in enough research income to cover their costs, and so they 
they were required to do the service teaching. Been the poor of the EPS, uh, well, yeah. and so, uh, but that worked. We 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 uh, cultivated good relationships with the people who were teaching our chemists, and and I think it worked very well. And you've made the point somewhere, and I don't remember exactly where. That I mean, I I think it's interesting. The question is, um, science is hard. Now the question is. It is hard, but it's also rational, isn't it? For example, when you learn a language, a language is generally not that rational. History is completely irrational. Um, at least science has a logic to it, which means you can work it out. Well, you know, science, scientific method is, is universal, and so you can understand other subjects, how they arrive at, at conclusions. Yes, it is, it is rational, I think. Uh, doesn't mean you don't have to learn some basic facts uh, in order to, to, to grasp it, but um, you, you can apply a, a logic which, which I think is appealing to. Do you think we put one young people off by making it sound harder than it really is? It's a fine line, I think, because you, you can't say to them, this is an easy option, uh, because if you're going to be on top of your, your game, you, you really have to uh, put a lot of effort in, and and you have to have the the tools to to carry out the job. So it it is difficult, but the rewards are great. So uh, it's it's not easy to be a, an accomplished musician, is it? It's not easy to be an accomplished athlete. You have to put the the effort in. Um, some if if people are put off uh, by the idea that something might be challenging. Well, they probably shouldn't be doing it anyway. I, I, but we, we're, we're in the business of trying to enthuse people. I mean, I like the analogy with the accomplished musician because the accomplished musician achieves much of that musicianship by just constant working at it by practice. It's not necessarily something which is blindingly genetic. Um, I mean, people talk about gifted musicians, but actually most of it is just doing it, practicing again and again. and Neuroscience has shown that, in fact, you develop those parts of the brain by doing that. Mm. I remember we were talking about noise earlier. I remember him saying to me when I first got there, uh, in his view, um, I, I was querying the idea that we would spend six full days a weekend, Sunday mornings, uh, actually working at the lab. And he just turned around and he said, well, if you're not sufficiently interested in what you're doing to want to spend that time, you shouldn't be doing it. And I, I went away and pondered that overnight and thought, well, he's probably right, you know. <laughs> Any case, he's the boss and I, <laughs> I'm, I'm the slave. But it, I, I, I've, I've come to believe that. I mean, I think you, if you are going to be uh, on top of your game, uh, you have to be engaged with it uh, almost all of your time. And uh, that doesn't mean you can't be uh, an interesting human being in other ways as well. You, uh, I think enjoying life is, is something which is important. One of the warm, I mean, you've had so many accolades and um, honorary doctorates and all the rest of it, but one of the things that must have given you most pleasure was being awarded the George Porter Medal. And you gave a lecture, of course. Kind of incestuous in some ways because uh, when George retired from the Royal Institution to become president of the Royal Society, uh, we had a, a kind of valid victory scientific meeting in his, in his honor. Uh, and at that meeting, we, we had a collection and some, with some industrial input as well. And we collected enough money to found this Porter Medal. So that's, it's relatively recent. It was 1986 that happened. And of course, we gave the first medal to him uh, and then every two years we've we've awarded it, uh, and w there was one additional one because we held a big international conference here in in '95, and we had a special medal for for that. That was one of my triumphs as well. Actually, we had uh, it was international conference on photochemistry, and we had five Nobel Prize winners uh, addressing the, the the audiences. It was uh, it was quite a coup. I think. Um, so George uh, was the first, and until me, only uh, Brit who, who received that medal. All of the others went to Americans or, or 
with two Europeans and, and two Japanese, I think. So I, I felt immensely proud to have been uh, awarded it, and it's an international committee in, from the United States, from uh, Japan, uh, well, uh, the Asiatic uh, countries, uh, and Europe, who, who, who made the selection. So I, I, I felt my science had been recognized, put it that way. Uh, but b the huge pleasure, of course, came from uh, having this medal in George's name, because a, a man I spent 20 years with and I, I hugely admired. David, thank you so much. That, um, that Renaissance view of science, you know, the idea that we become uh, our best science has to have a public face, a public meaning, and a sense of responsibility. Um, and it's wonderful to see the kind of work that's done by great academics like yourself here at Imperial College in London.